You have no reason to convict me. You're full of This is Grace, and her life was tragically taken from her on her birthday during a date with Jesse Kempson, who she met on Tinder. Now, Jesse would go on to say that this was a case of rough sex gone wrong. But if this is true, then why did he take intimate pictures of her body and upload them to adult websites and search flesh-eating birds just moments after committing the murder? And if he was truly innocent, why did he take her remains, stuff them into a suitcase, and leave it in a grave he dug across town? And most importantly, how was this all captured on camera? This is the case of Grace Mullane. Grace Emmy Rose Mullane was born on December 2nd, 1996 in Essex, England. She was the youngest of three siblings and her parents were David and Jillian Mullane. Now, Grace's family was described as down to earth, genuine, and overall a tight knit family. However, her two older brothers, Michael and Declan, they shared a particularly close relationship with her. And throughout their lives, the Mullane family lived in the same house since Grace was nine. Now, within those walls, they created countless memories with their pets, hosting holidays, summer parties, and even taking several vacations across Europe. Now, friends and family described Grace as caring, compassionate, bright and fun-loving. And her father, David, who came from a large, close-knit family of 10 siblings, saw the same qualities that everybody else saw in his daughter. He even referred to her as Gracie. Grace attended St. Joseph Catholic Primary School in Stamford Lee Hope before transferring to Brentwood Ursuline Covenant. And she spent her two final years at St. Thomas More High School. Now, Grace's friendly nature made her very popular among her schoolmates. People felt that she was the type of person that you would meet and just felt like you could trust instantly, like you had known her your entire life. Even Claire Bailey, the school chaplain, who's like a counselor from what I understand, said that Grace was a kind soul and always had the brightest smile on her face. And in addition to her personality, Grace was talented. She played field hockey and was an artist. Grace shared her paintings and sketches on various social media platforms, and her artistic ability even earned her recognition when one of her pieces was featured in London's esteemed mall galleries. And following her time in high school, Grace enrolled in the University of Lincoln in Lincoln, England. And at the start of her college journey, she found herself in a committed relationship with her high school boyfriend. However, after the first two years, she decided to go separate ways. And Grace wasted no time in embracing her newfound independence and decided to explore the dating scene. Grace, however, did have a side to her she only shared with her partners that she trusted the most. And I'm sharing this only because it actually plays a role in the story, but Grace enjoyed rough sex, more specifically BDSM. It seems that Grace had multiple social media accounts across various fetish websites, and she expressed her openness to wanting to explore some different experiences. Even Grace's ex-boyfriend acknowledged engaging in BDSM with her. However, they had a safe word because they knew how dangerous it could be. Now, I want to be absolutely clear when talking about this. Your sexual preferences or the things that you do or don't like don't define you as a good or bad person. It seems like mainstream media picked up on this about Grace and tried to paint her out to be some sort of bad person who had this coming to her, which is absolutely obscure to me. You're allowed to like things and expect for people to respect your boundaries and keep you safe when engaging in these acts. And if you think otherwise, you can just close the video. It doesn't matter. Grace worked hard during her college years, taking on temp work in her father's office while nurturing her talent for art. However, there was one passion she hadn't fully explored yet, and it was her desire to travel. And despite having a loving family, supportive friends, and a promising future, Grace wanted to experience life outside of her hometown. So when Grace graduated from the University of Lincoln in 2018 with a degree in marketing and advertising, she was filled with excitement. She would finally go on her long-awaited backpacking trip she had been saving up for diligently for years. And despite everything that Grace had going on for her, she remained a kind-hearted person. She even decided to cut off her hair and donate it to the little Princess Trust, providing wigs for children with cancer, which speaks volumes about her character. And in October of 2008, at the age of 18, 
Grace began her journey. I can't imagine my child at the age of 18 leaving. I mean, at that point, I guess you have no control as a parent, but still, I, I think it would be a very scary thing for me. Now, this trip would have been the trip of a lifetime. Peru was her first destination, and she shared her experiences through photos on social media and frequent conversations with her family, who she kept in close contact with. Her family mentioned that she would send them constant updates, letting them know that she was okay. After Peru, Grace continued her travels through South America for six weeks before eventually reaching the place she looked forward to the most, which was New Zealand. And she arrived in Auckland just a few weeks later. Following her time in New Zealand, Grace had plans to visit Fiji and Australia before ultimately returning home. But little did Grace know that this would be her final stop. On November 30th, 2018, Grace arrived at a hostel called Base Backpackers, where she stayed with other travelers who were also in Auckland that night. Now, during her stay, she connected with a man on Tinder. And on December 1st, Grace arranged a meet up with that man. It was the day before her 22nd birthday, and Grace didn't have any plans. Now, initially, she didn't seem particularly interested in the man. However, he eventually managed to persuade her to meet him at Sky City around 5.30 p.m. Grace left the hostel and headed to meet him. She was dressed in a little black dress paired with white sneakers and a small purse. And along the way, she even took a picture of a Christmas tree in the courtyard and sent it to her parents to check in and letting them know that she was okay. The following day on December 2nd marked Grace's birthday. Family and friends who had been receiving regular updates about her travels began reaching out to her, sending her their well wishes and birthday greetings. However, there was a problem because there was no response from Grace and phone calls were going straight to voicemail. This raised immediate alarms. The family went from getting daily updates, letting them know that she was okay to silence. After a couple days had passed, Grace's parents decided to reach out to the Auckland police. This was on December 5th and officially reported her missing. Initially, the police didn't really take it serious or with much concern. They didn't think it was particularly strange for a young woman in her early 20s to have no contact after a day or a night of drinking. After all, she might just be hungover, right? And it's true, in my early 20s, I would go out and probably not come back for a day or two. And it's probably because I had been drinking or you know, spend some time with somebody. Now they speculated that she may have stayed with some friends or her phone could have just died, which is also strange because the mass majority of people would freak out if their phone was dead for a couple of days. They would ask their friends for a charger or they would walk to the gas station and get one themselves. The fact that none of this was concerning to the police is a little strange to me. However, it's how it went. The police actually didn't take it serious until they contacted the hostel where Grace had been staying at, and they were informed that she hadn't returned at all, and her belongings were still there. Detectives started examining CCTV footage from the local area in hopes of finding any leads, and they were able to quickly identify Grace's date. The CCTV footage showed Grace meeting her date near the same Christmas tree that she had taken a photo of for her family. He approached her confidently, then hugged her, and then the two walked away together. Now they headed to Andy's Burger Bar, and the footage captured not only their initial meeting, but also various moments throughout their night together. And as they moved between bars and joined drinks, the two seemed to be getting along almost too well. They were even seen cuddling and kissing, and it seemed like they were just genuinely hitting it off. And at 9.40 p.m. on the eve of Grace's 22nd birthday, security footage showed her and her date returning to his apartment. They looked just like any other couple coming back from a night out of drinking. They were walking with their arms wrapped around each other and even holding hands. And as detectives examined the security footage, they found something a little strange. You see, while Grace was hanging out with her date around 9.20 p.m., she excused herself to use the restroom. Now the security footage captured her date going through her purse, which is super crazy and concerning. I can't think of a single reason as to why this would be okay. It's just so damn strange. The police also spoke with Grace's friend, Amina Ashcroft. Now text messages that Grace had sent Amina indicated that yeah, they were hitting it off. She had mentioned that they had been in communication throughout the night, and she could tell from Grace's messages that she was really drunk. Amina mentioned that she noticed some red flags and how Grace described her date, but she also mentioned that Grace just seemed happy. And she said, I click with him so well. And the last message that Amina received from Grace, she said, I'll let you know what happens tomorrow. 
The police examined Grace's social media accounts and made an interesting observation. Shortly after Grace returned from the bathroom and her date had been going through her purse, he posted a comment on her Facebook profile picture. And the comment he left read, beautiful, very radiant, which is, again, kind of strange. However, this comment alone is what helped them identify who her date really was. The man in the security footage, Grace's date, was 26-year-old Jesse Shane Kempson. Jesse was born in Lower Hutt on December 28, 1991, and he grew up in Wellington, and his parents went through a separation when he was just nine years old. And afterwards, he was mainly raised by his father and grandfather. However, whether influenced by his upbringing or born with these traits, family and friends paint Jesse as a very unpleasant person, nearly Everyone who had contact with him referred to him as a compulsive liar. Even his own stepbrother described him as a pathological liar who enjoyed having power over others. These weren't just small lies either. Jesse went through great lengths to uphold his lies, claiming that he was dying of cancer and had connections to gangs. Even the landlord of his apartment, which is a full service apartment building similar to a hotel, initially believed Jesse to be a high ranking manager at a company called Woolworth, earning a six figure salary. However, the landlord grew a little suspicious when he noticed Jesse wandering the halls at all hours, repeatedly failing to pay his rent on time. And eventually, the landlord discovered that Jesse's rent was actually being paid through state benefits, not the six-figure salary that he claimed to have. This revelation contradicted Jesse's claim of being a successful businessman or a professional softball player. And in reality, he had actually lost his job as a telephone salesman the day he met Grace. And as soon as the police identified Jesse from the security footage and social media, they knew that they needed to speak with him. They went to his apartment building just to have a conversation. However, when Jesse saw the police, he quickly turned around and tried to make a getaway. And of course, the police noticed and managed to chase him down and bring him in for questioning. Now, during the questioning, Jesse recounted the events of the night. He began by explaining that they had met at Sky City. He admitted that initially he wasn't sure that Grace was even a real person because there's a significant amount of catfishing on Tinder. Again, this is according to him. And according to Jesse's account, at the end of the night, there was a hug and a kiss on the cheek, and then they went their separate ways. He also mentioned that they had no plans to stay in touch. However, the police just didn't believe Jesse because there was security footage of the two getting on an elevator and heading towards his apartment. Additionally, the police searched Jesse's studio apartment, which was the last place that Grace was seen alive. But as they delved deeper into their investigation of Jesse, they uncovered something that was super concerning. Jesse didn't just raise red flags within his family and business relationships. His behavior also extended to romantic relationships. Women described him as overbearing and controlling. He had a pattern of dating multiple women at once and presenting himself as a successful, well-groomed man. However, things quickly would take a turn for the worse every single time. He would badger women, pressuring them to divulge their sexual experiences and prying for personal information. Numerous women began accusing him of being nothing more than a creep. Now, in the days leading up to his Tinder date with Grace, Jesse was facing financial difficulties. He was behind on his rent and had been fired from his job. And it seemed that his web of lies was catching up to him, and he was likely spiraling out of control at this time as a result. Fortunately, there was an abundance of security footage that captured Jesse's movements on the day Grace went missing. From what I understand, detectives had sifted through six terabytes of security footage to figure out what had happened the day that Grace went missing. For those of you who are a little less tech savvy, considering that that footage is probably low resolution, it's a lot of footage. Multiple and multiple and multiple days and hours worth of footage. And they went through all of this just to be able to reconstruct the timeline of the events of the day. The cameras in the building where Jesse was living recorded him entering the elevator at 8 a.m. on December 2nd, which happened to be Grace's birthday. About seven minutes later, he left the lobby and headed towards Elliott Street. Detectives carefully watched the footage observing Jesse as he browsed through the aisles of a department store. He eventually ended up buying a suitcase and later around 11 a.m. he bought cleaning supplies. And here is where it gets crazy. The investigators were shocked to discover that several hours after these purchases, Jesse went on another 
Tinder date. And when the police interviewed the woman who went on the date with him, she reported feeling extremely uncomfortable with his presence. She went on to share some of the statements that he made, and it was clear that, well, she was uncomfortable. During the date, Jesse brought up the topic of shopping for a large duffel bag just earlier in the day and claiming it was for sporting equipment. However, things took a dark turn when he mentioned the show Murder, She Wrote and commented how one wrong move could lead to someone spending their entire life in jail. He proceeded to share a disturbing story about a friend or a person he knew who had asked his girlfriend to engage in rough sex involving strangulation. And according to Jesse, something went wrong and despite his attempts to revive her, the girlfriend tragically passed away and his friend ended up being charged with manslaughter. I'm at a loss for words at how disturbing that really is. I don't understand what there was to gain by telling this date that. And if that wasn't disturbing enough, he continued to make unsettling remarks to her. He informed her that police dogs can only detect bodies that are over four feet deep. After this, the woman felt so uncomfortable, she wanted to leave the date right away and declined the ride home. And Jesse, unfazed by this, just carried on with his day. He proceeded to gather his cleaning supplies and left to rent a rug doctor cleaning machine. He told the employee at the store that he needed it for red wine stains that had gone on his carpet. And security footage even captured him dragging the rug doctor up to his room a little before 9 p.m. And on December 2nd, around 9.30 a.m., Jesse was captured on security footage, pushing a trolley loaded with noticeably heavy suitcases into the elevator. He then packed them into the trunk of his rental car and surprisingly just seemed unaffected by the entire situation. He even engaged in lighthearted banter with one of the employees in the lobby as he returned the trolley. And bright and early on the morning of December 3rd, Jesse went on another suspicious shopping trip, and this time it was to purchase a shovel around 7 a.m. He then dropped off his bags at a dry cleaner and proceeded to go to the car wash, and once again was caught on camera power washing his car before returning it to the rental company. And strangely enough, Jesse had left the shovel he had just purchased in the morning leaning against the wall in the car wash. Then on December 5th, the same day that Grace was reported missing, Jesse was spotted carrying bags that he dumped into various trash bins throughout the city. And as this was was happening, Grace's father, David, flew into the area to aid the search, and on December 7th, he made a heartfelt plea to the public for assistance in locating his beloved daughter. And understandably, he appeared utterly heartbroken and devastated. We're all extremely upset, and it's very difficult at this time to fully describe the range of emotions we are going through. While we are very grateful for the media coverage, both here and back home, we are finding this situation quite upsetting and would sincerely hope that, these, that the media continue to respect our privacy. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to anybody who has seen, spoken to or come into contact with Grace over the last few days and to come forward with any detail, no matter how, many, how small, and contact the investigation team. Once again, I thank you all for coming. Now, during their initial conversation with Jesse, detectives were told that he and Grace parted ways on the street around 10 p.m. and he claimed to have no contact with her since. He even stated that she had blocked him on Tinder and just wanted nothing to do with him. And on December 8th, detectives interviewed Jesse one more time. And this time, the story had drastically changed. According to Jesse, when they returned to the room, both of them were heavily intoxicated. They began passionately kissing and engaging in conversation. And according to Jesse, Grace turned down the music and started discussing topics related to bondage and Fifty Shades of Grey. However, he informed the police that Grace had a preference for BDSM and asked him to engage in it. Jesse maintained that Grace started biting him and requested him to reciprocate, claiming that he asked for consent and she agreed. As their sexual encounter intensified, Jesse described Grace as holding his arms above his head, biting and spanking him, and even choking him to an extent. He alleged that she instructed him to hold her throat and increase the intensity. According to Jesse's account, they eventually ended up on the floor, and afterwards, he got up to take a shower and accidentally fell asleep. When he woke up, he returned to bed, and it was dark and he didn't see Grace, assuming that she had just left and carried on. Jesse went on to claim that he woke up the next morning to find Grace on his floor with blood coming from her nose. He panicked but insisted that this was all just an accident and it was her fault for asking him to choke her. 
speak to us about the events of last Saturday. Is that correct? Yes. Tell me what happened last Saturday. Um, from the beginning. Did you kill Grace Mullane? No. Okay. Jesse Kempson, you're under arrest for the murder of Grace Mullane. The detectives eventually charged Jesse with the murder of Grace, and following a forensic search of Jesse's room, the police discovered traces of blood all over his apartment. And the blood told a much different story than a simple nosebleed that Jesse claimed. Surprisingly, Jesse did cooperate with the police and agreed to show them where he had left the body. Shockingly, this turned out to be the very same spot that he had mentioned to his Tinder date. He said that it was the place where something terrible happened to his friend. I find it hard to believe that people like this even exist sometimes. I just, I don't understand. Detectives soon discovered Grace's lifeless body at 4 p.m. on December 9th, and approximately 12 miles away from central Auckland. And on December 10th, just nine days after Grace went missing, Jesse appeared in court with his identity kept hidden. And the details that emerged during the hearing were absolutely horrifying. And it only went on to further solidify his image as a freaking monster. The investigation did confirm that Grace had been strangled and she had bruises on her arms and chest, indicating that she may have been forcibly restrained. And according to forensic reports, the pressure on her neck would have lasted anywhere between four to five minutes. And as if this wasn't messed up enough, his search history just after killing Grace was truly telling of his intent. He searched flesh-eating birds, the hottest fire, and the specific location of where he actually buried Grace's body. But it doesn't end there, because Jesse went on to take intimate photos of her lifeless body and uploaded them to adult websites. This has to be one of the sickest things I have ever heard. I couldn't even imagine what her family must have felt going through this entire thing. It just, it almost sounds unreal that somebody could do something like this. During Jesse's trial, which started in November 2019, his defense attorney tried to argue that this was all just an accident. However, all the evidence pointed at the fact that this was deliberate. And not even just deliberate, it was calculated. And on November 22nd, 2019, a jury consisting of five men and seven women reached a unanimous verdict, finding Jesse guilty of Grace's murder. Remarkably, it took the jury about five hours of deliberation to reach that conclusion. And as a result, he was sentenced to life in prison and eligible for parole after 17 years. You're so full of shit. You have no reason to convict me. You're full of shit. I'm not sure what the laws are like in New Zealand, but this is the type of person that you want to just leave to rot in jail. I'm sorry. From what I have understood, it seems like Jesse's family has even turned their backs on him. They just want nothing to do with him. The lead investigator even expressed that if it hadn't been Grace, it would have been somebody else eventually. Now, Grace's family and friends are dedicated and actively engaged in two campaigns dedicated to honoring her memory. The Love Grace campaign is one of them, which involves donating handbags filled with essential items to support women leaving toxic situations. This idea emerged from Grace's own love for handbags. They essentially fill these bags with essentials for women in need. They were also able to raise a large amount of money to an organization committed to ending male violence against women. It's also worth noting that in 2020, Jesse also faced other charges against his former partner. He essentially held a knife to her neck and coerced her into doing sexual acts that she didn't want to do. He choked her and even drained her bank accounts. For that alone, he received an additional seven years. Furthermore, Jesse was found guilty of sexually assaulting a young tourist that he had met on Tinder a year before meeting Grace. I can't even begin to express how sad this case really is. The fact that Jesse had gotten away with so much before even meeting Grace boggles my mind. And I understand as a woman fleeing from a toxic or violent situation, sometimes the fear alone keeps them quiet. But I do wish that somebody would have stepped up as it could have prevented Jesse from ever meeting Grace. My heart truly goes out to the family of Grace Mullane, and I hope that they find closure in knowing that Jesse will be behind bars for the rest of his life. And if you really want to help the channel out, hit the like, the subscribe, and the alert as it's absolutely free and it goes a long way to letting me know that you're enjoying the content that I'm making. So until next time, stay safe and I will see you when the lights go out.